Oh, you thought we were finished, huh? With the poor reception of The Last Night, the Transformers movie franchise was in free fall. No, wait, uh, I take that back. It was already at the bottom of the canyon. Made a cartoonish crater like Wile E. Coyote and everything. After five films, Bay was done. The Bayverse was done. They had originally planned to open this whole thing up to a cinematic universe, but, uh, Drunken Merlin put an end to all of that. God, I'm sozzled. The audience was sick of Bay, and sick of Transformers, really. Yet the studio had already greenlit some projects. What were they to do? Simple. Get some new blood, for God's sake. Had I made this series a few years ago, it probably would have ended on some note that Transformers is dead, and Michael Bay killed it. <laughs> I'd throw my fists in the air, screaming at the camera like Doug Walker or something. But this is Transformers. The franchise is resilient. After Transformers 5, the series went in a different direction. It was a much needed change that brought on new life in a movie series that's almost... Oh god, it's almost 20 years old. And it all began in the most Hollywood way possible, with a stealth reboot. Bumblebee, stop f***ing the man. Remember how Bumblebee was in World War II? I sure did. Well, forget about that. He's not anymore. It never happened. He actually landed in the Bay Area in the 1980s. A Bumblebee prequel was in the works for some time. The same time as last night, actually. And remarkably enough, it was pretty unfazed by the absolute shit show going on with the Bayverse. Its original idea was close to the final product, which, if you've seen it, seems absolutely bonkers. Really, the notion of a Bumblebee prequel, in general, kind of sounds bonkers. Not in a good way. Like, this is a really bad idea way. Who cares what Bumblebee was doing before Transformers 1? No Sam Witwicky? No Shia LaBeouf? Just say Christ is Lord! Count me out. That's such a great dynamic. I think Sam interacts with Optimus more than his car buddy. Either way, it's still a dumb idea. It could never work. Oh damn, it worked. Bumblebee is a movie that should not exist, but I'm glad that it does. You can always tell when a movie has people behind it with a passionate vision, and it's even better when they execute that vision very well. It has a few bumps in the road, I'll get to that. But man, I'm shocked this wasn't supposed to be a reboot in the first place, because the very way people interact in this movie is completely alien to the Bayverse. Like, they're not screaming at each other, or being fucking weirdos, which, hey, let's get this out of the way first. No Michael Bay. Bumblebee was directed by Travis Knight. I guess you could say that a knight killed Transformers, and a knight brought it back. <laughs> no, not the fake. The visual language of this film is so entirely different from the rest of these movies. From the cinematography, to the editing, to how the action scenes were choreographed, there is not a hint of Michael Bay influence in this movie. Which is ironic because he was a producer, and it was all done with Michael Bay's blessing. He essentially said, this is your movie, and was very generous and supportive, and didn't try to impose his own aesthetic or point of view on the movie. Honestly, pretty cool of him. If you didn't know Knight, you know what he's done. He was the lead animator of Coraline, directed Kubo and the Two Strings, and he founded the animation studio Laika. He's also the son of Nike founder and billionaire Phil Knight. So that leaves a question. Why is he doing a live action movie? Why Transformers? And the only answer I've been able to find is that he loves Transformers. So much so, in fact, it was his idea to do something drastic with the Transformer designs themselves. He basically went up to the studio and asked, Hey, why don't we make them look like Gen 1? And the studio went, Wait, what? For a decade, the bots had been a mix of jagged edges and random polygons. The Decepticons were gray monsters, and the Autobots had horrifyingly humanoid faces. Oh god. So the prequel just didn't do that. They took the simple blocky designs of the 80s run, and just translated it into CGI. And it works. It works so well. A little too well. Like, let's not kid ourselves. For a lot of people, the first two minutes of this movie, set on Cybertron, kind of overshadows the rest of the film. And can you blame them? Decepticons. Attack. I'm typically not the type of person that does the whole pointing at recognizable character and 
freaking out thing. This made me feel some man-child emotions. I tell you what. Destroy the launch pad. Let none escape. It was perfect. My favorite part is actually how it rewrites the mythos for the whole Transformers live-action universe. Because we see the Autobots just get their asses kicked on a Cybertron that is still very much alive. Cybertron isn't destroyed, they just took it over. That's why little Bumblebee is getting sent off into space like Goku. Or Superman. Or Megamind. And it's really cool because when the Decepticons interact with the humans, they call them the Autobot Rebels. A dangerous criminal from our world is hiding somewhere on yours. Alright, enough about that kitty crap. It's now time for us real men to be in control. We're gonna sit down and watch the rest of this wholesome movie about a teenage girl and her robot. And you're gonna like it. Travis Knight, Travis Knight, Travis Knight. Yeah, he directed it. Cool. But he didn't come up with the story. He didn't write the script. No, that credit goes to writer Christina Hodson. She went for a smaller story revolving around a concept as old as time itself. A boy and his wacky out-of-water friend. Or in this case, a girl. E.T., Short Circuit, Iron Giant, Jack Frost, f***ing Mac and me. It's a trope that's used a lot, but hey, it works. That's honestly the best way I can describe this movie. Bumblebee is a very enjoyable mashup of a bunch of ideas you've seen a thousand times over, but done in a heartfelt and creative way. It's like 80% Iron Giant. 90% Iron Giant. Charlie is a teenage girl in a funk because her dad is dead. And it doesn't help that her mom immediately got together with another guy. What the fuck, mom? She's continuously building the car that she and her dad were working on together before he died, despite not owning a car herself. But is gifted a junker by her uncle on her 18th birthday. Guess who that junker is? Bees? Beads. Beads. The whole movie is just the relationship between Charlie and the big yellow guy. It's a very good dynamic. Dare I say, a better dynamic than what Sam had with Bumblebee. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. Just go in the garage quietly, please. <laughs> Which, hey, that makes sense. B was just Sam's introduction to a greater conflict and a cast of characters. But in this movie, Bumblebee has an entirely different relationship with this girl. He's there to kind of bring purpose into her life to push her past your grief, because nothing makes you stop worrying about your own troubles than taking care of something else, because it's so damn stupid. He gets in wacky situations, because he's dumb. Bumblebee had a voice. Sorry, Mike, hit a little traffic. But upon reaching Earth, he was tracked down immediately by a Decepticon and had his voice box ripped out. I guess when that happened, he lost his memories too, and his IQ dropped by 200 points, turning this adept Autobot soldier into an innocent and well-meaning dumb robot friend. Like a big E.T. Look at his silly face. He's so cute, he's causing tens of thousands of dollars in property damage. Charlie has to keep this robot from being discovered by both John Cena and her mom. As little does she know, her new robot friend is being tracked by two Decepticons and Sector 7. Never heard of it. Never will. This is the only movie where Decepticons actually deceive anybody. And it's the government. Even after telling them they're called Decepticons. They call themselves Decepticons. That doesn't set off any red flags. There are only three, really two Decepticons in the entire film. Blitzwing doesn't really count. He lasts a total of 30 seconds. And for what we get, it's worth it. Dare I say these two are my favorite villains in the whole live action series. Yeah, even more than Megatron. Sacrilege, I know. You don't need an endless army of nameless gray Decepticons here. Just two bickering back and forth lug nuts will be enough. Eventually, because Bumblebee is an idiot, he gives away his location to the feds, and they track him down, and execute him since he's too stupid to be useful anymore. That's right, Bumblebee dies in the Bumblebee movie. It's just like Black Widow all over again. Except here, Bumblebee actually comes back to life. Sorry, Natasha. <laughs> it's all thanks to the power of love or something. It's that type of movie. In the end, you know how things go. The Decepticons try to get a signal out to bring their army to Earth. Bumblebee has to stop them. He kills the blue one with some chains. 
kills the red one with a boat. And the final fight is just a robot on robot slugfest. Look at him go. Bumblebee is small, but he doesn't let that stop him in a fight. Like a true short king, he finds a way. I guess it doesn't matter how cool of a Decepticon you are, even if you have three transformations and can turn into 80s muscle cars, you can still get crushed by a big boat. Life's just funny like that. So there you go, Bumblebee. I'm gonna be honest, the longer I spent editing this review, the less praise I really had to give. When I first saw Bumblebee, I thought it was a breath of fresh air, especially compared to, well, you know. I'm an inventor! Yet as time went on, with each revisit, the cracks start to show. So, let's talk about the bad stuff. Bumblebee is a good movie. It's cute, it has heart, and it has a decent arc around grief. But it borrows so much from other things. For one, references. Fucking 80s nostalgia. Bumblebee was at the tail end of the 1980s nostalgia boom, all thanks to Stranger Things. And like any 80s nostalgic media, it has to spend every waking moment reminding you that this is indeed in the 1980s. Pong, Elf, Miami Vice, remember Breakfast Club? Remember Reagan? Remember when Saddam was a US ally? Oh hey, it's that one song. You got the power! The only thing that isn't in the 80s is Charlie's hair. Ah! While that is annoying, the problem kind of goes deeper than that. Like, the references are in the essence of the film itself. Like, if you've seen E.T. or Iron Giant, you've seen Bumblebee. I don't even know if this scene is technically an homage or a ripoff. What, what is it? Where's the line? Please, stop! You are what you choose to be. WTF to that. Bumblebee is a typical coming-of-age story tied into a Transformers film. Dealing with bullies, coming out of your shell, wacky hijinks. I mean, is that so bad? No, not really. If it's set out to be a palate cleanser at the long end of this road of madness, then it achieved that. Good job. But if it's set out to be original, then I, I say it failed. This might sound crazy, but I don't think this movie is better than Transformers 1 or 3. Don't laugh. Those movies at least had unique stories to tell. They were flawed, but they took bold chances, you know? Some were bold than others. Now I think about it, the fact I'm even comparing these is kind of insane. Like, the Bay films are world-spanning, globe-ending disaster flicks, and this is an 80s homage adventure coming of age thing. Herbie the Love Bug with Optimus Prime. At least it's not trying to be Michael Bay without Michael Bay. Oh, I've never seen anything like this before. That's Optimus Primal, the tough and fearless leader of the Maximals. Thank you.